Hi, everybody. Welcome to another event sponsored by CLAIM or CLAME, the Center for Language, Music, and Emotion, our research center jointly sponsored by the Max Planck Society and NYU, where we have researchers at NYU working on these topics, in Germany working on these topics, and together working on these topics. And we've had uh, a series of events over the last, some live, and unfortunately, of course, the last year, not so live, but we've had successful and engaging online events. Um, we record them You can, for your viewing pleasure later. Um, we have more planned for the rest of the year. And today is we're very excited to have Stefan Alexander, who was actually suggested initially by one of our colleagues in, at NYU, Jonathan Winnar, who will also introduce him. And the rules of engagement today are after Jonathan gives some introductory remarks, Stefan will talk for maybe 30 minutes or so and, and give a little yeah. context. Well, and that's... then we will just kind of grill him and have hopefully a fun conversation about jazz physics, the physics of jazz, the jazz of physics, and whether it's coherent or whether we're just making things up as we go along. And we hope it's a fun and interesting event in the context of our series. So. And if you want to get on the mailing list of claim, please do. If you have friends that want to hear about stuff about these kind of topics, send them our way. So thank you again, Stefan, for um, accepting our invitation to participate in the event. And we look forward to, to your presentation and talking to you. Thank you. So um, I'm John Winower, and I remember uh, attending the first claim event, uh, the opening event where there were um, uh, uh, speakers, there were talks from scientists and there were performances from musicians. And uh, I gather that one of the interests in the center is um, looking at some of the links across uh, science and, and music. And a few months ago when I was having dinner with Stefan, I thought who better fits that bill than uh, today's speaker, Stefan Alexander, uh, who is a physicist at Brown University uh, and the Simons Foundation, and also a jazz musician, uh, saxophone player. Um, I, I've known Stefan, I was thinking about this morning, since um, 2004. That's when I moved from Boston to San Francisco to finish my PhD at Stanford. And uh, at the time, Stefan was a postdoc at Stanford at, at SLAC, uh, which I guess used to be a, a high energy accelerator or something, and is now basically a theory group. Um, and, um, but I didn't meet Stefan at Stanford. I met him uh, in a bar uh, or a club. Uh, there was some live jazz music and uh, Stefan will probably remember the people. We had some mutual friends, uh, Jake Leland and Jonathan Goldman, who are kind of academic musician types. And uh, Stefan and I realized that we both were commuting from San Francisco to uh, Palo Alto, to Stanford. And, and some days we drove down together. And you know, he would tell me about some of his work on um, cosmology and physics and the very early moments in the universe and this idea of cosmic inflation and uh, what it is, what was happening with energy and, and matter and, and space in the, and during the, the birth of the universe and how that related to big theories in physics and how it related to the, uh, the, to the evidence that, that to, to try to look for confirmation uh, of this idea and, uh, and his own spin on it. He was, he was working on, on these topics himself. And um, you know, these were great and interesting fundamental topics. And, and then, you know, sometimes Stefan would say, so, you know, John, what are you working on? And, um, you know, what are the big questions in your field? And he was always uh, very interested in learning about other topics, not, not just the kind of narrow areas that, well, not narrow, but not just the areas he was working on. And um, though maybe I was a little embarrassed about the fact that I didn't think I was doing anything quite so fundamental. And maybe our whole field, I thought, wasn't quite mature enough to have such clear and fundamental questions. Yeah, you know, we did our best to engage. And, uh, and, and Stefan clearly was interested in many topics, um, including psychology and the brain and, and thought. Uh, he was also, of course, interested in music and he was playing saxophone. And, and he was clearly good, uh, though I think at that time, Stefan was giving some thought to um, how much time and energy he could really dedicate to this, given that he was also a postdoc and trying to launch a career, uh, an academic career. And I, I think, you know, y y you would probably all agree that 
it's hard enough to succeed in as a career in theoretical physics, but if you want to couple that with another field with low probability success, how about professional musician? So um, Stefan was not particularly um, thrown by challenges. He took them both up and has continued in both of these domains to this day. And in fact, um, in addition to his academic writing and his performances, he also uh, wrote a book about the topic that um, David Popel referred to, uh, The Jazz of Physics. Uh, it's an interesting book about, um, which I have here, about, um, um, I got at the Strand, uh, um, about physics, about music, about the relationship uh, across these fields. And I like the title. I think the easier title would have been the physics of jazz, because we kind of all know that music is based on waves and physics, but the jazz of physics is a little more of an interesting spin. Um, he's also working on another book. Uh, I'm not sure if the other book is out yet. Um, I love the title of this book, uh, Fear of a Black Universe. And um, it's a five word title, but I, I think it's like a, uh, uh, at least a triple pun because it refers to um, uh, Fear of a Black Planet, the Public Enemy album from, I don't know, 1990 or so, um, uh, you know, which was featured in uh, Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing, and I think really captured a moment in, in music and, and culture and, and frankly, racial tension in New York City. Um, it also refers to um, Stefan himself, right, because he is a Black scientist and um, has faced some, some issues, I think, because of that and feels that um, at times that's not always uh, welcome and um, that, that has been an aspect of his, his career and his life. And it's also a reference to his specific interest in cosmology and the universe and uh, dark energy, dark matter and the origins of the universe and black holes. So um, to get this kind of triple pun into a five word title, I think is genius enough reason to want to read the book. Um, but of course, Stefan also has plenty of interesting things to say, I'm sure. Um, another reason to get it. And a reason for me to get out of the way and turn the mic over to Stefan, um, I would ask you all to welcome him as our guest. Um, and let's hear what he has to say today. Well, um, we, we, uh, I, I dearly refer to my friend and, you know, and colleague, of course, um, we call, I call, still call him Winnower. And we have an inside joke sometimes to call him Loserer. <laughs> no, but it's like, it's all, it's all love, John. John, we really appreciate. Um, and I, I regret never getting it on, under that, um, your MR, MRI to, to test me for being synesthetic way back in the days. You know, heaven knows that, you know, oh, anyway. So, you know, I really regret because I would have been, there would have been some amazing bragging rights, you know, you know, being at the bar and telling people, yeah, they, they scanned my brain. Um, so I really, I'm very, um, very honored and grateful to be, um, to be, you know, um, yeah, to be invited and, and welcome. Um, you know, it's not often that I get invited to to speak at other people's in other people's club, you know, so to speak. And and also, there's some interesting resonance too because um, I met um, Professor Hartley uh, many years ago through a mutual friend, Jaron Lanier, a virtual reality pioneer. And Jaron swore that this woman was a was a genius, and um, I know I I second that. And um, so I also want to acknowledge. Um, my colleague and Pablo, I spoke um, uh, at a mall talk um, last year and said some really crazy stuff. And it's a, it, please don't, um, you, you know. So anyway, today is going to be even crazier. Um, and so let me just begin. Um, and I'm now going to share screen, and um, and just go 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 for it. Um, so I just decided to give the, give it this fun title, my cognitive helix. Um, a journey of the mind, cosmology, and jazz. And I want to acknowledge um, my um, home institution, Brown, and I'm on sabbatical actually here in New York City at um, the Flatiron Institute, um, the Center for Computational Astrophysics. So I want to just thank them for their hospitality and thank also my colleagues um, um, also at NYU um, in the physics department. Um, so much of what I'm talking about here is you'll find in my upcoming book. It should be released at the end of the summer called Fear of a Black Universe. It is about the invisible, the unappreciated, um, those dark things in our universe, including dark ideas, ideas that might stigmatize us, but those ideas that may be necessary to get us to the next level in our pursuit of, um, of understanding our, our world and ourselves. 
Um, and basically, I think the common thread in, the, in my kind of talk is I really have this about me personally. Um, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, right uptown. There's nothing, when I think about my sort of upbringing, there's nothing really, I'm a typical New York kid. I went to a typical public high school in New York, not, not one of the specialized schools. I went to Dewey Clinton High School in the Bronx. Um, at the time, there was a 60% dropout rate. But, you know, state, uh, st uh, Tracy Morgan was in my class, but though he did drop out um, um, <laughs> for good reasons, <laughs> that also led to his success. Um, there were some interesting hip hop groups that were coming through, the Ultra Magnetic MCs, um, Brand Nubian. So I kind of grew up in that kind of culture. I grew up where it was expected that I too was going to be um, growing up in the 80s, um, going to take on that, that role in music. And, and I was very interested in that. Um, and, you know, had some talent in that as well. Some of my friends ended up producing Biggie Smalls, Tupac. So that was definitely a common and a, uh, an expected um, situation for me. And, you know, and let me just say as a young um, African American kid, um, you know, when we look, you, you look around, you see what society reflects back on you. It was, it, it was clear to me that you know, that's what's to be expected of me stereotypically, even though I did love it. But I was also very, like a lot of kids, I was very um, inquisitive about the world around me. Um, I think we all have a soul and I think we wonder about our own mortality, even at a young age, and even in an environment where we saw things going on. Um, and so I really did struggle with being, should I be a musician or a scientist? And that struggle continues on today, actually. And what I'm going to talk about is just an interesting gift that came out of that. Because I did pursue um, the scientist route um, more professionally. And I did find myself in situations where, yeah, I didn't feel welcome. I, not only because of my race, but because of my personality. Um, and I kind of want to talk about that and talk about actually the hidden treasures in that. Um, and, and again, like, I, you know, I want to thank MC Rakim because he was one of the people that made it okay for me as a young kid in the Bronx. Because in, if you look at his rhyme there, this is, I heard this when I was 14 years old, and he made it cool for me to be a nerd. He goes, that's what I'm saying. I drop science like a scientist. My Mel D is a code the very next episode. Has a mic off in the store and ready to explode. I keep the mic at Fahrenheit, freeze MCs to make them colder. My listener system is kicking like solar. I was just explaining this to my colleague, David Spurgel, that this explains how a star becomes supernova, but that's another conversation. The other one was Albert Einstein, who continues to be an inspiration. And in terms of my ability, not my quest to reconcile, you know, am I a scientist? Am I a musician? What am I kind of thing, profession? Where do I belong? Who's my tribe? Um, and Einstein was one of these people that made me realize it's okay to maybe just be yourself and you can still be good. Not maybe not as good as he is, but he was an example of like, you know, he wore his personality on his, on his sleeves and he was able to be his best um, scientific self. Now I'm going to tell you a particular story. Now, as you know, with every, with every story, it's stories are well in, in retrospect and in hindsight, well curated and um, leave out certain details and leave out other perspectives or other. Um, but let me just tell the story and then we'll make our own conclusions from that in, our, in the conversation. Sounds cool? It begins. So after my PhD, after my PhD, um, I decided to not, as much as I loved Brian Green, he offered me a job when he um, started the Ice Cap Institute, which was an institute to bring together cosmology and string theory. And Brian was very generous and um, very loving. And he even said, come, come back. And I, I spent summers in New York working in his group. But I went off to Imperial College London um, because that was you know, because I was, Abdus Salam founded that group and he was a Pakistani Nobel Prize winner. And there was something about, you know, the lore of going, going to that place. And I went. And when I was in London, but I deep down and secretly, I knew I wanted to basically get involved in the underground jazz and music scene in London, the Asian Dub Foundation and like, you know, Soul to Soul, the Africa Center. I wanted to go to Brixton and play music during, at, at nighttime and do my physics during the daytime. And those worlds were separate from each other. But I was struggling deep down. It's also had, people call it imposter syndrome. I just felt like 
I basically felt like I was a complete fake. I felt like I really didn't know. I didn't have my chops together as a physicist. I'm a theoretical physicist. And Imperial at that time was the mecca of basically when we think about the hardcore mathematical side of physics, that was the place. And therefore I felt way over my head. I didn't have my chops together. And I was faking it all the way. I mean, I would go into my office, pretend like I was working, not coming up with any ideas. And then I get a then I get a um an email about six months into my postdoc from um, Graziella. She is a, a Brazilian woman who also was very kind to me. And she said, Dr. Aishim would like to meet with you. Dr. Aishim was a theory, the, the head of our theory group, theoretical physics group at Imperial College. And he, by many in our field, is considered to be, he, you know, he, he came through with Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking, like they kind of grew up together in physics. He's known to be probably amongst the most technical and mathematical of um, our, in our field in mathematical physics. And so I didn't, I just knew about his reputation. So basically I was scared of this guy and I avoided meeting with him and opening my mouth because I knew he would find, he would realize that I was a fake. So I, I said, oh my goodness. And I walked into his office, tr almost trembling. And when I walk in, I see this guy, this tall Englishman, um, with a kind of proper British accent, you know, and goes, have a seat. And I sit down and I look around and I see a statue of like this angel and I see symbols. The, his blackboard has very abstract diagrams, no, no, no math. I'm like, what's going on here? And this is a picture of Professor Chris Isham. And what we're looking at here is his book. Um, you know, he, he, this is a very this is one of the Bibles, if you really want to learn sort of mathematical underpins of quantum mechanics. Um, and below, he was one of the people that pushed the idea of, of growth and Dyke's approach to, to differential algebraic geometry. Um, part of that's called topos theory. Um, anyway, um, and Chris was the person that brought that into quantum mechanics and quantum gravity. So anyway, I'm just, I'm there. I'm like ready to like, you know, be basically get fired. And he goes, why are you here? So I said, um, is this some kind of koan or something? Was this guy asking me? I said, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here because I want to be a good physicist. Think about being pulled over by a state trooper and he asked you if you're, you're just going to keep it real. He said, okay, man, here's my license. You just, it was like, I just kept it real. He goes, well, if you want to be a great physicist, you see those physics books in your office, just throw them all away. He goes, you know, you know, aside from like, do my stuff, you know, um, and he kind of relaxed in his chair and he goes, hey, yeah, you know, I do, um, I, I'm also like certified in, in, in Jungian dream analysis. Uh, would you like to do dream analysis with me? I said, well, if this is going to like, let me just go along with this. So I said, sure. Why not? I said, okay, come every Monday and you'll sit down here and you'll tell me your dreams and then, you know, I'll analyze it. And he goes, and what, what got me there was, of course, fast forward a few weeks down. I mean, of course I do this. Chris had me and two other postdocs at his place in um, um, uh, Holland Park. He has a beautiful place in Holland Park in um, and, um, Kensington. And um, we saw this huge sheet of like a stack of like about, you know, 500, 300 pages of papers or something like that. And we were, the postdocs were looking at this thing. What, what, what is this? It's like, What's, what's he working on? And um, it turned out like when he, he left to get a glass of wine, a bottle of wine, we went and we looked at the cal calculations. It was all this new stuff that basically he woke up in the middle of the night and like all these were equations that revealed himself in his dreams. So basically the catch for me was that he told me that he learned how to calculate in his dreams. And I was like, well, maybe I can learn something from this guy. So that's what we did, okay? So basically he made me read some, um, this one book on Ion or Aeon by Carl Jung. Um, and then, you know, I had to read up on some of that stuff and another book called Adam and Archetype. Um, and so here's a little quote by Jung. In addition to our immediate consciousness, which is of a thoroughly personal nature, there exists a second psychic system of a collected uni collective universal and impersonal nature, which is identical in all individuals. Now that's a big claim. <laughs> Obviously, Jung is referring to this notion of the collective unconscious, and we'll get back to that. 
So Pauli, I want to talk about Wolfgang Pauli. Pauli won a Nobel Prize um, for many contributions to the development, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And here are some, you know, Pauli um, was called the conscience of physics, others nicknamed him as the frightful Pauli. He was that dude, he was that a-hole that would come to your talk and catch a sign error and destroy you in a second. He was that brilliant. He was that base, he was the, that that person, okay? Um, but Pauli's mother committed suicide because she discovered that um, her husband was um, creeping around on her. And Pauli married this woman who was very, you know, had problems with that, but his wife left him in two weeks. So he was nearly suicidal himself. And so he 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 saw Pauli, he saw Young for, for quite a while, actually. And there's a book called Adam and Archetype where that's the other side of Pauli, where Pauli undergoes this dream analysis with, with Young. And what, this is... Um, this one dream um, revealed itself in this diagram called the world clock. And you see like a dark side and a light side with these what looks like angels or whatever it is. And what that, that basically is this idea that Pauli had that somehow the physical world has a reflection somehow in the psychic world, okay? They're dual, like, like a wave particle duality in quantum mechanics, a kind of like a generalized principle of quantum mechanics. But anyway, my point is that like, I, mean, I wanna, kind of want to pull you in that what I was engaging with here with Chris wasn't coming out of thin air. Um, now, one of my dreams I had with Chris was um, weird things. I would, you know, come and say, well, I had this dream that, you know, and it, it, my, most of my dreams are uneventful. They were like, well, I, you know, I, 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 I dreamt, I was worried that this, that this person that I, you know, that I'm in love with would leave me or like something else. You know, it was weird, nothing of, you know, most dreams that many normal people will have. But one time I had a dream of, um, this is supposed to be like a bad image, but the dream was, I told him I had a dream. And again, there was nothing special to me about this dream. So yeah, I, was, I had a dream that there was this old guy in a white robe in outer space. And he was in outer space and a, a, a blackboard, a whiteboard actually appeared because the space was dark. And the guy started scribbling some equations really, really, really fast, and I couldn't comprehend it. But clearly, there was something of consequence to these equations. And I asked, I said to, um, and then I, I, sub I surrendered to the, to the old fellow. And I said, listen, please, I want to know what you're doing here. But I just, I'm too dumb to understand that you're, what you're doing is so quick. And then the blackboard disappeared, and the old man started swirling his hand, like in a, you know, in a swirl motion. And this is supposed to denote that. And then I kind of said that as if it was nothing special. And then Chris Isham jumped and goes, tell me more about that dream. So tell me what direction did he, did he swirl his hands in? And how fast did he do it? Like, I said, why is this guy asking me this? Anyway, fast forward a year later, um, I'm in New York City. So what year, we're talking about 2000 and 2002, I'm in New York City. And my friend Jaron is in New York, Jaron Lanier. He goes, Hey, Steph, when you want to he calls me Steph, you want to go to, you want to go see my friend Ornick Coleman? I was like, Wait, you know Ornick Coleman? That Ornick Coleman? Goes, yes. So I go to see Ornick Coleman. And Ornette um, seriously asks him, he's like, So what are you working on? What are you thinking about these days? I said, Well, I'm thinking about string theory and the vortex and cosmic inflation and all this stuff. And I thought that he would just, you know, say, Okay, dude, I just don't. I'm just a musician because I, I would do that with a lot of my jazz friends and they would just say dude just stop that stuff let's just talk let's play some music you know he was just like tell me more and I was like well you know the vortex is a spiral like motion and you know we it has you know system of trap energy like the eye of a storm like you know water flowing down the sink and and he goes you know I play the vortex and I was like whoa you play the vortex. He was like very serious when he said that. And that kind of stuck with me. I don't know, I can't explain why it stuck with me. What we're seeing down here is a MIDI representation um, of um, one of Ornette's Solman, Coleman's solo called Chronology. There's also a notational um, transcription and the notational transcription is very different. Um, what you see in this, this looks more like, you know, you see in shapes that are very interesting. And, I think that's kind of the space on it was playing as much as he was playing also like you know, melodic ideas. 
he was also playing in geometry and shape. And that's a much longer conversation uh, moving on. So that's something to keep in mind. A year later, after my dream at Imperial with the spiral, this came up. And then I go to Stanford for my second postdoc. Um, so a year later. And I find myself in a situation where I got spoiled living in Europe. Um, you know, in Europe, there's, they don't really have a system of affirmative action there. And I think a lot of my, my colleagues, um, fellow postdocs when I was there, kind of felt like, what's this guy doing here? Like, we work so hard. I mean, this was sentiments that was revealed to me um, by um, other trusted friends that somehow people back, you know, being an African-American theoretical in a top place, many of them felt like he didn't work as hard as we did to get here. He got it through affirmative action. So because I knew these kind of things, I didn't feel quite accepted and fitting in. And again, um, it led to some feelings of loneliness and rejection and stigma. Um, so I found myself often working alone. I was very productive and half of, let me just say half of my, my half of my 12, no, a third of my 12 publications were single author papers. So I'm proud of that. But there were advantages though. And that's kind of one, there was a positive spin on this. Because, because I knew I wasn't in the club in my, I, back then, I had less concerns about, um, less concerns about talking to people like John Winower and talking to people from other fields and even like fully engaging and integrating what I was doing with my music into other, from a field because it's sort of like, well, this guy's a good for nothing anyway. So, so I was like, okay, if you think so, I don't have anything to really prove to anybody. And I could just like do it. And if I don't make it, that's fine. I can, I, I find my way kind of thing. Um, and so, so anyway, that's important because one day I, I used to have to force myself to go to work, to go to campus. Um, and one morning I was like, I rarely cry, okay? I mean, but I, me I remember feeling like it was so hard to go and face my colleagues and, and you know, not be engaged. If I try to talk science with them, they wouldn't talk back to me kind of thing. Um, because I did, the truth of the matter is I did. I, I, I did, I did, I, what, I, I, you know, I did what I, I did the best that I could. And I didn't have quite the training that they had, maybe. Okay, so maybe they saw it as not as um, sophisticated or worthy of engaging me, and I, it hurt my feelings. Um, so I, but I remember in that moment, um, there was a problem that we were working on in in, in my field at staff Stanford. And let me also add, while I'm saying this, um, I also had a great time at Stanford, and I had some great colleagues and great mentors. Um, while I'm saying this, okay, so I still, I, I, I'm very thankful of those experiences. Um, and I want to give a shout out to my, to my advisor, Michael Peskin, who I'm still in touch with, um, who taught me a lot. And this concerns actually Michael Peskin. So in a nutshell, what we're looking at is what we call a space-time diagram. This cylinder you see here is actually supposed to represent something about the space-time geometry of what we believe to be our early universe. Let me explain this. If I, if I saw at the bottom of the cylinder and I go to the top, I want you to imagine that it's flowing in time, going from some early time to some future time. And if, I, if, I, if you look at the waist, I want you to think of that waist. It looks like a circle, but I want you to think of that circle as a three-dimensional sphere. And what we're seeing is that the sphere is large and then it collapses and it, it grows again. And don't pay too much attention, well, you should, to these lines you see. They represent how light might traverse as the space is contracting and expanding. And the vertical, um, that horizontal, the kind of um, diagonal thing right across it, and the slice into the center, is how is where light, the speed of light will be traveling. So that's basically the fastest that you can travel if you're if you're situated in, in this expanded geometry. This is we, we believe to be the geometry of something called cosmic inflation. Now, of course, I'm 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 being um, I mean, approximate what I'm saying, all right? But there are equations behind this. This fits into our theory of general relativity. And we believe that in our early universe, the universe started at some point that we might want to, you know, point some singularity. We're not going to talk about that now. And it expanded very in a wink of an eye to the size that we see today from a tiny microscopic situation. And that's where the action during that time, like all the structure that we see no, the universe is void. It is, you know, it, it is what we call vacuum. 
there's no matter, there's no antimatter, and somehow matter should win over antimatter. And as I was walking to work, it, I remembered my dream of the spiral a year ago at Imperial or two years ago. And it turned out that that spiral, if you see at the bottom, represented something called helicity. Helicity is nothing more than if I spiral in one direction, if you see that spiral, and I reflect that in the mirror, the spiral reverses itself, all right? So there's a kind of, or we want to call that chirality in some sense. If I look at my right hand in the mirror, I don't get my right hand back, I get my left hand back, okay? So there's a sense of handedness. And my dream somehow situated me where I was able to connect this helicity with the space-time diagram and then realize a solution or a way in to understand how from a void empty universe, we can generate more matter over antimatter. So that led basically to this paper with Michael Peskin and my colleague, Shig Yabari, which, now, you know, which is now well-cited. And that, that paper was published in you know, one of the top journals in our field. Um, and that's an example of like, again, this spiral following me, okay? And again, was it a coincidence that this dream came in right in that time, that time of discomfort actually. Um, so that's something. And then not too long after that, I was invited. This is not me to show off like, you know, that I was you know, 10 pounds lighter back then. <laughs> but <laughs> um, what we're looking at is just a little um, advertisement um, done in 2007. And, um, and it, it, it's from the Cornell Street Cafe that many NYU um, lovers um, would probably go to that's no longer with us. And they had this thing called Entertainment Science that was curated by Roel Hoffman, Nobel Laureate, um, who's also a poet. And he invited me along with, as you see here, um, NYU's own Robert Rowe. Okay, and we both were in, invited to give a talk about how science and music, you know, in, uh, influence us to the public. And so I give my talk and, um, and I'm basically BS and I'm talking about the cosmic, you know, this inflation thing and John Coltrane and I'm like making some stuff up, you know. I was trying to understand whether or not as a saxophonist, I couldn't really understand giant steps because I didn't know, I couldn't pl play over it. I couldn't solo over those chord changes. And I was trying to get in on it through mathematics and geometry. Um, obviously that's not where a train was maybe living, but anyway, my talk was about that. And then Robert talked, talked about, for the, and the first time I met him, gave this talk about how he's teaching machines how to improvise. So then after that, we had dinner and we really hit it off. And he was like, and then Robert took me very seriously because I was like, yeah, I'm trying to understand this geometry of Coltrane and all this stuff. And, and he goes, well, let's, let's talk about that. So we met, we had coffee. And that led over the years to become a collaboration between Robert and I and our students. And what we're looking at here is um, a diagram that John Coltrane drew. This became the topic of my book, The Jazz of Physics, by the way. And where Coltrane is trying to understand basically what Einstein did for physics, he wanted to do for music. He told us to, um, the composer, um, um, David Amram, who communicated this to me personally. So our game, what Robin and I were trying to do now was to see whether or not there's some, so the, the, what I basically told Robert was, listen, Robert, you know, I play the sax and I, I, I really suck, and, but I'm good at, I, I know how to think about physics. And there's a part of me that, that when I play, I'm trying to visualize the patterns in my head and somehow when I listen to Giant Steps, I get the sense that there's something going on there with symmetry and there's some code, there's some pattern in that that I'm going after. And Robert took that very seriously. Said, well, let's do that. He said, my friend Elaine Chu, um, my friend Elaine Chu um, developed this thing called a spiral array. And maybe we can get some, a toehold on that by looking at this geometric model. And many of you know that there's been this whole attempt to geometrize um, what we call tonal pitch, pitch space. People like Ray um, Jackendorf and Fred Lordal up the street there have um, de definitely developed that. So we are kind of entering into that, but also from this more, is there more an algorithmic approach to what's going on cognitively? And again, this is where Robert was living because many of y'all know that Robert is a pioneer in, um, in, 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 many, in that field. And so I was in good hands and our game was to ask, is there some kind of cognitive geometry or pattern template underlying the chords and solo 
and with our our um you know our place our pivot point was um coltrane's giant steps so the, the idea we want to take giant steps and that system and um you know and do something with that um and can this be if we could if we found something can we generalize this other forms of improv improvised music and so the, obviously i would like to have a venn diagram um but we tried different things and we tried different types of math and looked at choose paper and carol kramanskill's work and we tried and we failed we disappeared i didn't see robert for a year or two we got back together we had coffee da 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 you know cafe dante this kind of stuff right we keep played at our leisure for several years and then something started coming together you see what we have a cluster and what we try to do is we knew that the end was to look at not three notes at a time or triads but tetrachords because a lot of jazz chords are based on you know um um sevenths and so what we're looking at is this cluster of sevenths in a space of pitch pitch space and this some geometry that's trying to reveal itself and we're kind of almost there this looks interesting but again it's not simple enough and then boom look what appears we find that the underlying geometry behind um, a lot of the system coltrane system is a double helix not just one spiral but two spirals and let me just in a nutshell what this is is every if i look to the, the bottom of the spiral to the top of the spiral think of that as a going from the from um say c to its octave so i'm climbing up in pitch space and this and the second spiral uh, is also the same thing and what happens is that you have the notes are alternating and complements so just like dna how you have one side of DNA and the genome has this complement. This system is structurally identical, but now it's in pitch space. So I'm gonna now close off and say, um, it's uncanny that the spiral has followed me throughout my research and, and my music career. Is this all in my head? And I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, thank you for um, your, your time. Thank you, Stefan. So we have time for questions. And our hope is that we'll get questions from the audience as well. So you can either um, put questions in the chat or um, I can also, I believe, unmute uh, people to speak. So if you would like to um, raise your hand or ask a question, please feel free. Right. I, can, okay. I, I, can, I can ask. Uh, oh, there we go. Question. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for for being here and for your talk. I really love I really love the content, the story, everything. I think is uh, you're bringing up some fresh air to to the field, and you know that here at Claim we love to work in between fields. So so we really appreciate your work. I have a very good question before before uh, allowing Leila to to speak. Um, I love this this idea of the double helix. Um, have you had you and Robert, who is also, as you know, a good colleague, have you had time to see if this applies to not only uh, this track by by Coltrane, but but to other 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 tracks or even other other artists? It's a good question. Uh, so definitely, we I would say that it will definitely apply to Western tone music and also music. Where the perfect fifth is central, so even um, non-Western music, where the fifth is a central thing, because this whole system seems to be generative of the fifth. Okay, that's the first thing. One of the things that we're interested in, Robert and I, is rhythm, though, is um, whether or not, because this is in frequency space, and we know that the frequency space is dual to the temporal space, and so we're interested also in rhythm as well. And we, we you know, obviously, I think rhythm is something that's, <laughs> you know, it is. I mean, right? Our heartbeats, um, babies here in the heartbeat. I'm, so I'm very curious about about that as well. So yeah, very good. And I think that um, you know, again, this is one of these things is like too too weird to to even take seriously. But thanks for taking it seriously. Um, I had a question. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, see, I I know a Le Layla in the psychology department, but um. You're probably a different Layla. Um, I'm a different. I'm a different Layla. Okay. Sorry that you can't see me. I don't know why. Okay, I'm hi, Layla. Um, 
um, yeah, I, I'm actually a colleague of Robert Rose um, in uh, music technology. Yeah, I just, I loved your talk. I'm very sorry I had to miss the first 15 minutes of it, but um, I, very, I really liked it. Um, a lot of what you said really resonated with um, some of my experiences in music. Um, but yeah, I, I was wondering uh, what you showed of the G, sort of G, uh, ge geometric patterns reminded me a lot of Dmitry Tomosko, um, a composer and theorist at Princeton. That's actually where I did my composition theory degree. Um, and I wondered if you were familiar with his work, because it looked a lot like that. Um, and some of what you're saying reminded me of what, what he says. Also, I was interested, I, I wish I knew more about it, but a lot of the fourths that you're talking about remind me of George Russell's Lydian chromatic concept um, of tonal organization. Um, and so I wondered how, if, yeah, I guess if you are engaged with other theorists that are using those geometric patterns like Dimitri of Moscow and I think other neo-Romanian theorists, but also interested to see how your work intersects with maybe George Russell or, um, or, or Nick Coleman's harmelodics. I just wondered how, how it intersects with, with, with uh, or if it intersects with that stuff. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so I'm extremely familiar with Tomasco's thing. In fact, one of the papers that we didn't publish is a mathematical proof. I mean, that's where I live, I mean, actually. So mm -hmm. um, Tomasco used some mathematics that's akin to string theory, which is something I, I, I work on um, professionally. I use called orbifolds. Um, so anyway, to make a long story short, the spiral array we can show is mathematically um, isomorphic in, in, um, to that system. Now it's, um, uh, you know, to some, to some extent, um, now it doesn't, but it, but it, the representation of the system that we have, I think is interesting because of this complementary hel helical structure, meaning that the map from, from this to other um, number theoretic structures, it becomes, um, there's a new, there's a new direction. I think that's very interesting. Um, yeah. From that level, now, the, 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 I'm extremely familiar with the Lydian thing because some of my teachers, um, like you know, um, um, some of my teachers um, got me hip to that many years. Joe Henderson and Ornette, who was my teacher for like 15 years. So, so and the homologic stuff is because yeah, because Ornette's been my teacher for 15 years. <laughs> so yeah, to, to, those are all great questions. I would love to um, follow up with you um, on some of the more de um, particular details. Yeah, that would be great. I hope, mm -hmm. to, I hope to get a chance to meet you with Robert sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm here all year. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I think um, Ed, yeah, go ahead. Great. I love your name. Thanks. <laughs> you sound like a hip, you sound like you got like a hip hop name, Ed Lord. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Got it, had it from birth. So, um, yeah, so um, I, I loved your talk. I loved your book. Uh, I gave your book to my girlfriend for her last birthday, actually. She loved it. I too. hope she's still with you. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I really love the idea of the spiral. I, I wonder, um, do you know about Roger Shepard's double helix model from you know the 80s? Uh, Roger no, no, Shepard please, was please Carol, tell me. Carol, no, that, that, Carol please, Crum no. Hansel's advisor, actually. And What's... he had a double helix model. And I wonder if you knew about it or if it's related or if it's different. I know nothing about it whatsoever. I mean, the, uh, the thing I want you all to take away in my talk is that this, this popped up as a surprise, right? We tried from, we were going after one thing and again, this popped up, the, 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 it just revealed itself mathematically to us. So in, in yeah. Shepard, one, uh, one helix is, the, um, uh, is uh, the chroma circle and one is the circle of fifths. Oh my God, this is crazy. <laughs> Could you please share this stuff with me? What's this person's name? Uh, Roger Shepard. Uh, it's uh, it's a Psych Review article from 1982. Do you know how he came about this? Um, he was just thinking about various geometrical models of pitch. Wow. So um, I can I can send you the article. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Also, I'm I'm interested um, in you know what you see as the relationships between you know sort of tonal pitch space and rhythm space. Uh, which are you know two things that I, I study in my we study in my lab a lot so I just like to know your thoughts so I'll, I'll give you a conjecture then I'll give you a conjecture the Fourier if I do uh, so if I if I if I go from frequency space right so the temporal domain 
to the domain of frequencies, it's like I'm living on two circles, right? I'm, I'm spinning around in one circle and another circle, but mm -hmm. the frequency is inverse to time. So, you know, if I, if I look at a wave and the wave basically has a period, you know, up and down, up and down, the amount of time it takes, right? They're inversely proportional. Um, so the spiral I can represent as a circle in some sense, it's a circle with some extra structure. And if I, so my conjecture is that if I, these two spaces are dual to each other, they get inverted. Um, so you're gonna maintain some structure when we go into the, into the temporal. So the study rhythm, I think we have to go into the temporal domain as the, as a space through which we are looking at you know, the change in, 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 in pulses and things like that in sound. And I think that there's gonna be a, some kind of a dual space, um, a space of a temporal space that this structure is gonna map into. And it'll be interesting to know if that structure is yet another spiral, but ordered in some interesting other way. Very interesting. Excuse me. So Jess, um, you had a question and you're up next. Uh, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, thanks, Stefan. That was, that was fascinating and inspiring. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I loved hearing about the, the motif of the, the spiral in your life. Um, and it made me start thinking um, about how we can conceive of these things, not just as abstract entities, but also as, as physical material. And I was immediately drawn to the idea of uh, electromagnetism as you were describing the concept of the spiral. And, um, yes, yes. As a lot of uh, the neuroscientists in the in the room can uh, attest to, um, they deal with uh, uh, coils all the time. Um, and so do musicians uh, in terms of uh, music reproduction, music pickups, things like that. Um, so. Uh, I, I guess maybe this is just a weird question that has no answer, but do you see any relationship or have you, have you thought about how, how the, the sort of abstract qualities of a spiral connect to sort of a material aspect of a coil? Yeah, I mean, um, that certainly we know that, right, if I put an electron in a magnetic field, it, the Maxwell equations give me that spiral um, solution, the solution of a spiral, that's really interesting. Um, um, material, a material, um, that's a very interesting question. I mean, another place this thing showed up in some crazy stuff is my colleague from Giant Banavar is a renowned biophysicist, theoretical biophysicist. Um, the temp their template for understanding the protein folding problem is exactly, again, um, the building blocks, the mathematical, all these spirals, the same exact mathematical solutions that we use and but with new real rules such that the over um, self-avoidance of these things give you predict the basic structures uh, underlying structures not completely of protein foldings folding so that's a sense in which it is the material of life that's um that thing. but i think as an algorithmic type structure it's sort of like a physical structure but the spiral itself is also algorithmic in, in some sense yeah i, and, I know that might not have the answer, but <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just speculating along, you know, I'm just, you know, dreaming along. Exactly. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Robert. Um, uh, yeah. No hard questions, please. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't have a question so much as just, uh, you know, uh, applause for uh, explaining this crazy trip that we've been on. I was right. wondering, it would be, I don't know if we have time to show the, the, um, the visualization of giant steps in the double helix. Is oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much for saying that. I do have, I might have, and I, I knew there was something, I, I was like, I, when you give these talks, you always forget, like, you know, like there's something I'm forgetting, and it's like something important that I'm forgetting. Which was, I, one of the, one I wanted to, I wanted to, things, huh? One of the striking things when I watch it is the center of gravity of the tetrachords as it goes through. I mean, it, it makes these interesting kind of shapes that sort of yes. Look one of the beautiful yeah one of the beautiful things that robin and i you know we are so grateful to our other colleagues um um, er, uh, um elizabeth L Lavero and aaron waters at the simons foundation they they are mass have masterfully coded up and collaborated with um with us on on, on uh, it's not done yet this is work in progress of visualizing that's where they live they 
they take all this great stuff we do at the Science Foundation and they, they figure out clever ways of, of bringing that, 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 that dream into reality. So what we're gonna look at very closely is some work done um, in collaboration with, um, by Elizabeth and Aaron. I wanna thank them um, for their hard work. And um, now the thing that we're still working on is making this more you know, in your face. And the sounds actually, you know, these are all template. And we're looking basically, this is not Coltrane solo, but it, the solo is through the chord changes and that's the important thing. So thanks Robert, you're a lifesaver. <laughs> Again, let me just find, you just gotta find the, um, I'm just gonna find the thing and um, okay. So now I'm gonna screen share and we're gonna look at what this thing looks like um, and hopefully it works, okay? <laughs> What do you have to? You were saying something about about what you saw there because you just. Recently... No, I was just saying that when what I find interesting is following that green dot in the middle, which is kind of the center of gravity of the tetrachords, I think, and that's sort of the motion that it makes. Kind of, I don't know if we can show this, but it kind of reminds me of the shape um, that Ornette's vortex had. <laughs> okay, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> this is a good thing about when you work with people who are just, in, you know. Um, yes, they, they just see their, I like to think of colleagues as people who make you smarter because they, they see things, they're like extra extensions of um, what you'd like to be. Okay, so we have some questions in the chat and maybe what I'll do is go ahead and read them or, or Kwame, if you'd like to ask your question, we can certainly um, unmute you to enter the conversation because we're, we're going to share this recording. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. So um, uh, he, well, maybe it's, it's more of a comment, but can you, can you share more about your time with Ornette Coleman? Uh, I wrote, and this is Kwame, I wrote an article on his album, Free Jazz and spent a lot of time with his unique, unique conceptual outlook. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on his thoughts. So I guess he's uh, asking for your opinion on sort of Ornette's, uh, conceptual outlook on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, what can I say? Well, first of all, I mean, uh, on that was, I mean, I referred to him as uncle on it when I, when I addressed him. So it was very, very close. Um, and through that closeness, I think things were transmitted. Um, and I mean, I'm saying th and things were transmitted in terms of my playing, like get me, he more got me to, to pay attention to things that I wasn't paying attention to like my like sound, like really opening my ears up, like really opening your ears up, okay? Um, and opening your mind up. And he <laughs> would say things that were like, what are you saying here? And then like five years later, you're like, oh, that's what you're saying. Um, so yeah, and definitely he was about, like, you know, when I think about how melodics, uh, he literally saw, he really, he really saw it, like going beyond like this idea of playing within changes and all these things, yeah know that and he knew that by the way i mean he knew bebop right but he really extended that into something that was linguistic and that was you know that was um you know that was like you know definitely from the church in a lot of ways yeah i mean that extended because of my work with melvin gibbs as well i mean we did some work melvin gibbs who also was a mentee of, of, of on it so you might want to look at some things that we did two years ago at vision fest with melvin gibbs and Mark Carey and um, Ronnie Barrage and some other, other Graham Hayes and people like that, uh, or called Ogodo Quanta. Check out, uh, so you'll hear Ornette there because <laughs> that was an avant-garde 
thing. Stuff, can you hear me now? I just uh, yeah. turned on my mic. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry about that. I didn't have things set up. But thank you for that. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I just wrote something on his album, Free Jazz, that basically talks a little bit about what you just said, which is this looking beyond the kind of tempered scale, right? The, the kind of 12 tones right. that we have in the chromatic scale. But it was also part of a bigger kind of philosophical outlook, which is kind of what I wanted to express. You know, free jazz happens at a particular time in American history, in global history. Um, you know, this was a time in which like protest was happening and when questions about, you know, can a multiracial, multi, uh, um, you know, multi people society actually exist? And, you know, this is before the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act of 64 and 65. So, yeah, I guess I, I wanted to hear more about you know, what, what kind of little philosophical insights did he share with you that stand out? You know, I know we don't have much, yeah. time. maybe your, your favorite ones. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Um, I think one, one philosophical thing was, again, like, you know, he was really, okay, so what, uh, long story short, I brought my friend Ani Patel out to see Ornett. He was all excited, asking Ornett all these theoretical questions. And Ornett's response to him was, I'll answer your question if you can tell me where an idea comes from. And that stumped completely like everybody. But that's kind of, I think, on that kind of was also, he lived there as well. And like, you know, the space of, you know, you know, the thought behind thought, if you want to call it that. Um, and I, so there was, you know, there was something deeply, if you want to say, if you want to call it philosophy. I mean, and the other thing too um, about him um, was just like Coltrane, on that didn't, have to talk about race and about being a black man in America. He, by simply embracing a younger one, like, like a person like me, who was not really, you know, I'm not there in the, in, the, in, the, in the big jazz scene doing it, but he embraced me and took me in as like an uncle and in that way, that form of mentoring, I think really also spoke about how he did see, um, <laughs> how he did um, live and express, um, if you want to say socio-political, philosophical ideas um, about just say being a black person in America, which was he took one of his own in and mentored and 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 loved him. So that's the most I can say. Okay, thank you. Um, so Scott said regarding Pablo's earlier question about the helical structure and the extent to which it generalizes. So when discussing Coltrane, one. Is there a contrapuntal rhythm that might be underlying the music, underlying in the music, or two, is the song just part of a larger conversation with another musician? Could you just repeat the second half of that question? It's a it's a great question. I'm just trying to. Yeah, the second half is uh, or two is the song just part of a larger conversation with another musician? Oh yes, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't talk about improvisation. I mean. Well, we can, but but in terms of this context, you can't talk about with it without interaction. So, otherwise, it's just too simplistic. Um, there's got to be some interaction going on, and the interaction between musicians is a <laughs> that's a big deal, yeah. And that's a whole can of worms that I'd love to talk about and learn um, from, and especially you know where you, in the psychological, emotional space, right? Like you know, there's a lot going on there. So, yeah. Great. Um, so, Taya had a question. Um, I can ask it. What about the pentagram, which is kind of a five thing and constructed by the golden section? Could you say more about this? Was it a step on the way finding the spirals? Excellent question. And I think uh, geometrically sound question. That's right. The, just to, um, if I could do a screen share with everyone. Um, the pentagram, Pythagoras, who spent 18 years in Egypt, came back with the pentagram, uh, as according to legend. And we can construct it by taking a, uh, you see my perfect circle there? And basically, right, um, we can uh, inscribe it. It's a very bad pentagram. And it turns out that the ratio of these lengths um, all give back the, the golden ratio. Um, and there's a, a circle inside here which basically becomes a base of a pyramid, which is, I think, very, which, whose ratio is also the golden ratio. And um, I really do think that there is, um, there is, 
there is, you know, when you connect this to the Fibonacci sequence, there is a spiral-like thing going on there, like the Nautilus, right? Um, that's so there, 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 there might be some stuff going on there too. Yeah, usually the golden ratio shows up in pretty much anything that's beautiful and mysterious. <laughs> Great. Um, Omri, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Hi, Stefan. Thank you for such a great talk. It was really um, a pleasure to listen to. Um, you, you mentioned the perfect fifth relationship being central. Mm -hmm. um, we know that this is like the simplest acoustical relationship besides the octave, mm -hmm. and that the diatonic scale has many potential perfect fifth movements within an octave yes. compared to other seven note sets. Yes. Um, I think the pentatonic has four, something like yes. that. Yes, yes. Um, totally agree. Do you believe that the spiral informs why these scales became so ubiquitous in Western music? Uh, and do you see the perfect fifth as sort of a fundamental constituent in how we process music? Um, it seems to be working out that way because I think one of the things that Robert mentioned is this idea of, of um, why do we do geometry? Okay, so that's like, give me the question why geometry? Why is geometry the the arena. And so in physics, now I can put my physics hat on, we now know, Albert Einstein taught us why geometry is the arena, right? Because geometry encodes symmetry properties, invariance properties, and also attractors, you know? So in, uh, like, for example, if you have a geometry depending on if that geometry is Newtonian or something, you get immediately the center of gravity, right? You can see this if I throw a very complicated object in the air, right? It's interesting that its center of gravity is a thing that traces out its motion as if it was a simple thing, rather than ignoring the detail. And, and so just, you can ignore all the details. Um, you can, so that's an example where we see geometry really the center of gravity. All these emergent properties seem to be informed by the geometry. And so we're asking a similar question here. Um, and I think that with your, your question about yeah, it's really interesting. And one of the things that got me hip to your field and where you guys live is that things that we took we take for granted in physics, like, oh, the perfect fifth. You know, like, no, actually, we don't really understand that why the mind likes that, you know, why, you know, higher level cognition. I find it to be so fascinating that what, why this duality of what one field considers to be taken for granted in another field is like, no, that's actually mysterious. <laughs> so that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a coffee conversation, okay? We can continue on coffee. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um... We have three more questions in the chat. I think we'll take them. And then uh, Joey, would you like to ask your question? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm, one of the things that struck me in your talk was when you said that you, you can't solo over Coltrane. And I just thought that was interesting because in some sense, anybody can solo over anything if they just want to do a bad solo. And so it seems like in the <laughs> deep, you know, I can do a crappy solo over Coltrane, but it just seems like our, our rubrics and our our standards or the way that we evaluate what makes things work in the musical world might be different in some ways from how we think about the physical world. And you engage in theorizing about the musical world and the physical world. And do you think that when you switch between these two things that you're doing something different, that different rules apply or how, in what ways might they differ or is it all just kind yeah, of- Yeah, thanks for asking. Stuff? Thank you for asking that question. I think part of also, I didn't say this, but I told you that there were advantages, you know, when you like, if you can liberate yourself a little bit from um, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, as Bob Marley said, <laughs> we talk about, um, for me, it was this kind of thing where then that enabled me to, like, just when I thought I understood something well in my field, when I look at similar structures in another field, it loosens me up a bit, right? It, 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 it's, it's a way of putting me, we all want to be, there's a, we all want to think outside the box. And one of the things I think this type of activity for me does, meaning going between different fields, it, it throws me outside the box mm. in a natural way. And I find that to be useful for, you know, helping me out in my, you know, in my traditional research as well. Got it, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, go, go right ahead, Matt. Hey, Stefan, it's, uh, it's Matt Herman. Hey, what's up, Matt? What's up? Matt okay. and I did some things together, at, actually at Cornelia. Great. Um, I want it, my, my, I don't know why my camera's not working, but um, I, some people have asked about some philosophical aspects of some of this. And um, 
there, I, I don't normally talk about this, but my area is harmonic analysis. And I've often thought about how, in some sense, it is like it is a, it is a demo, democracy because the Fourier transform is a, a global operator. So when, when you perform the Fourier transform, you're kind of collecting together all of the different elements that you're operating on and you get an output and you've, you've taken into the effects or the interactions of all the different pieces. So in that sense, it, you know, it's this idea that we're all connected. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're not really looking, I'm not looking at spirals in this new work I'm, I'm working on. And I, I told you about it the last time I saw you, mm -hmm. but it's this idea of connecting traits and the genetic networks that are kind of underlying them and their duals of each other. And, um, you know, it, if you look at a population and a trait for a population and you look at its trait and its genetic network, that's the Fourier transform. And that network is the result of all the different elements or people or individuals in a population. And then the inverse of that is given the genetic network, all the individuals in the population are drawn out of that same genetic network. So there's, there's a real duality. And I mean, it, it, you, you can get kind of hippy dippy, you know, but someone asked about philosophical interpretations and um, you know, how we're all connected that all of these things are, have, have a relationship. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thanks for that perspective, Matt. And um, let's, uh, let's reconnect. Cool. Great. And I, our final question, I think that, that we can have Stefan take today is uh, from Oded. Oded, are you there? Would you like to speak? Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, I am going to be more technical. And I wonder, you know, I saw the movie you just showed, you know, of the helix and how the music goes through and the green dot that, you know, the trajectory of the green dot. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you take speech which is dynamic, but yet we uh, reach the you know, time frequency information. Yes. How would it look like through your representation, especially the evolution of the dot with time? Well, you just raised a great research question, actually. So let's talk more about that. I think Robin and I would love to talk with you about that. OK. Thank you. OK. New collaborations. Okay, well, thank you, those of you who have um, stuck it out. Um, and uh, thank you, Stefan, for, for coming. David, did you, you have the uh, claim director prerogative. Did you, you have a final question? You mentioned you did earlier. I am, um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the, the prerogative. First of all, thank you, um, Stefan, for- I like your guitar back there. Really thank cool. you. Mm -hmm. I'm in one of my kids' rooms. Oh, <laughs> good. Um, Thank you for the very personal perspective on, on your research, on your trajectory, which is, um, I imagine, a lot of aspects which have not been fun. And you raised them a little, you know, sort of gently, but uh, I would imagine that it's not also easy. Um, and that perspective is particularly important because I, I want to get back to that one second. One, so what I really liked about the talk is when you started out, I thought the notion of Helix uh, was very metaphorical, and you were, going, oh, so. and it was sort of you know you you came to it with dreams and sort of intuition, and in the end you're talking about uh, mechanism and not metaphor, which really puts makes it a very concrete hypothesis, and that sort of links maybe what what Joey was raising earlier, talking about the domains of working as a physicist and working as a practicing musician in slightly overlapping ways. I, I like going from metaphor to mechanism because otherwise I was going to call you out on it. And right. So, look, the next time we meet, I'm going to be like, I'm going to push back a little and say, is this just a bunch of superficial description just because it feels good? Right, 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 right. But there's a there there, which I appreciated. And I really like the, the potential for experiments. And I wanted to maybe just to, uh, as an outro for you, ask mm -hmm. you something a little bit different. You know, you're, I mean, you've had a you know important academic career, and you're a professor yourself at Brown, and you are the supervisor of, of other people's research. And I wonder, in light of your experience um, as a black academic and as somebody who's between fields, you can say just a couple of words about what, how you think about actually supervising your own students and postdocs because of your own. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, well, we just some, you know, interest, just your perspective on that, because we all struggle with that. And you have a particularly unique one that I think would be nice to hear about. Yeah, I would say that, thank you. I think um, in some ways, I mean, it's interesting. 
I know that in my early, earlier days as a faculty, like I, I feel bad for my grad students and students back then because I was like, damn, like, you know, I, what, <laughs> what, what, anyway, so I, you know, we learned, but I think that one of the things I think is very important for me is to, um, to, uh, is to show, demonstrate my um, vulnerabilities as a, as a, as a researcher, as some, someone, it's like, yeah, I actually got this wrong. I, da, 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 like, it's all good. However, you know, I, you know, here are some things I know really well, and let's take, take that to the next level. Um, but let me just, I think another way of saying this is, um, for this talk, for example, I, I invited my students to this talk, for example, let them know that I'm, you know, I'm engaged in this type of stuff. Um, it's kind of like a coming out of the closet type of thing, right? You know, intellectual closet. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, and the reason why I think this is important, I don't know how to articulate this. Maybe y'all can help me figure out how to articulate this. Um, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, we have, we have this cognitive engine. I don't know. So the way I think, the way I do my physics, like really things that are, might be very precise and sharp and, as you said, mechanistic. And I feel that if I'm not comfortable in my own skin, that kind of thought process, process gets cluttered up, uh, becomes constricted and strangled. So by inviting and creating an environment for my students, and I do have, um, I do have a, a, a very willfully um, um, diverse group across uh, many um, dimensions, actually, um, that, 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 that those students feel collectively and also in interacting with me that they can be comfortable and um, be themselves, whatever that means, because I believe that they do their best thinking um, and exploration, including um, technical thinking when they are comfortable and relaxed and instead of trying to be somebody else and trying to fit into the idea of, you know, this is what a scientist should look like and talk like and be like. So that's kind of where I'm coming at it. And I've gotten good results as a result. I find that my students are kicking butt in my, in my you know, humble judgment. Yeah. Thanks for asking that question. No, but I think that's a very, it's a very nice perspective. I, <laughs> a bunch of us would agree. And if you feel, if you're comfortable and happy, you can do your best work. And the other thing that's important about that, I mean, my provost, Richard Locke, who is like, you know, one of my great mentors, he comes at it from, so I'm, I'm also a student of this too, because that also gives a space where I, they, I can also be frank with them. Like he said, Stefan, well, I'm going to be frank with you. And it's like, you're welcome to frankness as well. You know, and I think that, you know, it's a duality there. I don't know how, what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, no, I think it's very, uh, it's a very good perspective. It's a nice perspective to end on. I mean, we also, uh, we hope, you know, you come to more of our events in the center at NYU or part of CLAIM. I mean, there's obviously lots of exciting ideas and collaborative energy and uh, fun things to discuss, disagree about, or even test together. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> we, we, we know what we're asking for. And I think we really we, we hope um, that you stay connected to, to you know, all of us who are, who are grappling with some of these issues. So thank you again for accepting our invitation. And thank you to Jonathan Winnar for connecting us all uh, for that. And thank you, audience, for coming. And thank you, panelists, for being engaged. And we look forward to seeing all of you more. And um, this will be recorded and available soon. And goodbye. Yes, Have a good. Thank you again, Stefan. Thank you. What you guys are doing is very special, by the way. Thank you. Thank you.